What do we want for our children? What do you want for your children? Happiness. Happiness. Health. Peace. Peace. Balance. Balance. Okay, so um, what I want for my children is that they should be good people, caring and compassionate, that they should be happy, leading fulfilling and meaningful lives, and that they should be successful in their careers. Uh, what might it take to be successful in the 21st century? What are people going to need? What qualities are they going to need to be able to succeed in their careers? Accountability. Accountability. Cooperation. Cooperation. Analytical thinking, flexibility, flexibility. resilience, resilience. <laughs> open-heartedness, open okay. So um, one of the things I think people are going to need is creativity. Um, everybody's been knocking their head against a wall trying to solve a certain problem. How can you think outside the box and come at it a totally different way and maybe be able to figure out how to do this? Um, flexibility, maybe you were planning to do one thing. And now another opportunity has come. Are you going to stick with the old plans, or do you have the flexibility to take advantage of serendipity? Do you have the flexibility when you get more information to admit you were wrong? Um, an example of poor flexibility is given by Alexander Graham Bell. He says, when one door closes, another door opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones which open for us. Another thing I think children are going to need is self-control. Um, being able to think before they speak or act, be able to wait a moment, and then give the more considered response, not put their foot in their mouth, um, et cetera. And discipline, having the discipline to finish what they've started, to see a task through the completion. Even though maybe you're incredibly bored with it, or there's a really interesting tangent you'd like to go off on, or all kinds of things. But you inhibit all the temptations not to finish, and you see it through. Well, um, evidence shows, in fact, that discipline accounts for more variation in final grades, even in college, than does IQ. And all of the above, creativity, flexibility, self-control, and discipline, are either executive functions or depend on them. And executive functions are what I study. So there are three core executive functions. One is cognitive flexibility, and that has to do with the creativity and flexibility. Another is inhibitory control, which has to do with self-control and discipline. And a third is working memory. And from those, things like problem solving and reasoning and planning are built. Uh, inhibitory control also includes selective attention, besides self-control and discipline. Inhibition allows us a measure of control over our attention and our actions. So rather than simply being controlled by external stimuli or our emotions or old habits of mind or behavior, it makes it possible for us to change. It makes it possible for us to choose how we react and how we behave, rather than being unthinking creatures of habit. It doesn't make it easy. It's not easy to change, but at least it creates the possibility. Children with less inhibitory control, that is children who are less persistent, more impulsive, and have poor attention regulation, as adults 30 years later, have worse health, earn less, and commit more crimes than those as children who had better inhibitory control, controlling for all kinds of other variables. And that's based on a study of 1,000 children born in the same city in the same year followed for 32 years with a 96% retention rate. Unfortunately, I didn't do the study. <laughs> um, but they conclude, inhibitory controls effects follow a linear gradient. So interventions that can achieve even a small improvement in that will shift the entire distribution of outcomes in a beneficial direction and yield large improvements in health, wealth, and crime rate for the whole nation. Working memory is holding information in mind and manipulating it. Anything that unfolds over time requires working memory, because you always have to hold in mind what happened before and relate that to what's happening now. So it's critical for if you're listening to a talk or reading anything. It's critical for being able to play with ideas in your mind. It's critical for understanding cause and effect, because if you do something and you get a reaction, if you don't remember what you did, you don't know why you got that reaction. What did I do? Um, cognitive flexibility I've already talked about. 
Okay, working memory is very ephemeral. It doesn't last very long. Like when you look up a phone number, how long can you hold that in mind? Intuitive insight arises partially from appreciating and working with the foggy quality of working memory and thinking, allowing the mind to make associations that might not always be linear or rational, that is creative. Meditative discipline maintains a balance between the creativity and the stability of concentration. Executive functions depend on prefrontal cortex and the other regions that are interrelated with prefrontal cortex in the brain. Nowhere is the importance of social, emotional, and physical health for cognitive health more evident than with prefrontal cortex and executive functions. Executive functions are the first to suffer and suffer disproportionately if you're lonely, sad, stressed, sleep deprived, or not physically fit. If things, something is not going right in your life, executive functions will show it first and most deeply. To show the executive functions that they're capable of, to achieve the academic outcomes they're capable of, children need to feel joyful and relaxed. They need to feel they're in a supportive community they can count on, and their bodies need to be fit and healthy. Our brains work better when we're not in a stressed emotional state, and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. And one reason is illustrated on this slide. Dopamine is an important neurotransmitter in prefrontal. Dopam uh, prefrontal cortex needs dopamine like your car engine needs gasoline. But imagine your car engine gets flooded with gasoline. Now that's not so good. And even mild stress floods prefrontal cortex with dopamine. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the brain, even areas that have much more dopamine. It's selective to prefrontal cortex. Um, stress impairs executive functions and can cause you to look like you have an executive function deficit like ADHD when you don't. You're simply stressed or you're simply sleep deprived. Um, in college, student, one month of stress in preparation for a major exam will disrupt prefrontal cortex functional connectivity. And the students show poor executive functions like attention shifting. When we're sad, we're worse at selective attention. When we're happy, we're better at selective attention. People show more creativity when they're happy. The most heavily researched predictor of creativity in social psychology is mood. The most robust finding is that a happy mood leads to greater creativity. It enables people to work more flexibly and to see potential relatedness among unusual and atypical members of categories. We all want our children to do well, but if they feel pushed or pressured, if they feel it would be terrible to make a mistake, if they feel they always have to be the best, they're going to be stressed. Being stressed is detrimental to their doing their best. You're not perfect, and you're not the perfect parent or teacher. And that's fine, because nobody's perfect. It's absolutely OK. And I can guarantee 100% that worrying about whether you're a great parent is not going to improve your parenting. It will only make it worse. Stress is not only detrimental to your ability to be a good parent, your children will pick up on your stress. It will cause them to feel stressed. And if they're stressed, their executive functions are going to suffer, and their school performance will suffer. Care for teachers, which uh, Tish initiated at the garrison, trains teachers in techniques such as mindfulness to help them reduce stress, feel calmer, and have a better sense of well-being. This helps teachers become more aware of and sensitive to children's needs and more emotionally responsive. This markedly changes the climate in the classroom. It brings more joy into the classroom and into teachers' lives. Care for Teachers uses traditional discipline, mindful movement practices with teachers, besides just a sitting meditation. And Jonathan and I were talking about this um, at lunch, that one of the things Montessori does, although they don't call it meditation, is a walking meditation exercise where they ask children to just walk on a line. For young children, walking on a line is as hard for us as walking on a narrow balance beam. And when they get better, you can make it more difficult. So here, the goal is to walk on the line, but make no sound with your bell. And everybody in the classroom can do it. You can follow the most dysregulated child. And you immediately know when your mind wanders, because your bell makes a sound. Because children in the Montessori program and the other program that's shown to improve executive functions, which is called Tools of the Mind, 
Exercise better executive functions, better self-control. Teachers don't have to worry about things getting out of control. They can relax. Without having to worry about being reprimanded by the teacher for misbehaving, the children can relax. There's palpably more calm and more joy in these classrooms. It's extremely important to relax and slow down so that you can take the time to give your children your undivided attention. The importance of that can't be overemphasized. The most basic and powerful way to communicate to our children that we care about them is to listen to them, truly listen. Give them our time and our attention. The quality of our listening rather than the wisdom of our words is often what has the most impact. And this is Scott Peck speaking. Children who are truly loved know themselves to be loved. This knowledge is worth more than gold. The principal form that love takes is giving of your time and truly listening. When something is of value to us, we spend time with it. When we love our children, we give them our time. True listening, total concentration on the other, is always a manifestation of love. Your willingness to listen is the best possible concrete evidence of your esteem that you can give your child. There is no better and ultimately no other way to teach your children that they're valuable people than by valuing them. When children know they're valued, they feel valuable. This feeling of being valuable is the cornerstone of discipline because when one considers oneself valuable, one will take care of oneself in all the ways that are necessary. Self-discipline is self-caring. And Rachel Naomi Raymond, perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is our attention, and especially if it's given from the heart. Listening is the oldest and perhaps the most powerful tool of healing. The Catholic theologian Henry, now uh, Henry Nouwen talked about this in terms of hospitality. He said, hospitality is the ability to pay attention to the guest. The paradox is that hospitality asks for the creation of an empty space where the guest can find his own soul. When a child is speaking, just listen. When we interrupt to show we understand, we move the focus of attention to ourselves. Because we care, we're tempted to want to do more than just listen. But what a child needs most is not for us to go into problem-solving mode, but just for us to listen, truly listen and care. OK, so to summarize what I've said so far, um, you don't have to be perfect, and worrying about it isn't going to help. If you're stressed, you can't be the parent you want to be. It's OK to make mistakes, and it's OK to be wrong. Young people need re stress reduced in their lives by resolving the external causes of stress and by strengthening calmer, healthier responses, as mindfulness does, and the importance of listening. Children need to feel understood and heard. They need to feel loved, that you care about them. They need to feel safe, that it's safe to open up and say what they're feeling. You won't embarrass them, that it's OK to make a mistake. And now where I'm going next is that we're not just um, emotions. We also have social needs, and those also affect prefrontal cortex and executive function. Our brains work better when we're not feeling lonely or socially isolated, and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. The psychiatrist Harry Stack Sullivan talked about how people are fundamentally social. It's part of our nature to be interconnected and to need others. Many people in North America, though, feel alone. 40% say there's no one with whom they can discuss their important personal concerns. There have been many studies that have looked at this, the effect of this on executive function. One study told one group of subjects that they'd be likely to have close relationships throughout their lives. Another group of subjects, they told the opposite prediction. And a third group of subjects, they told unrelated bad news. So on simple memorization questions that don't require prefrontal cortex, all the groups perform comparably. But on logical reasoning that requires executive functions, those told to expect that they'd be lonely perform worse. Other um, investigators haven't tried to manipulate this. They simply ask you how you're feeling. So they do a little survey before the study. Do you feel lonely? Do you feel socially supported? And one study, for example, found that people who report that they feel lonely show less efficient prefrontal cortex activity. Children need activities where they can help one another. Mm -hmm. Learn that each is an important part of the whole. Learn to collaborate. Come to see the value of collaborating and cooperating. And we're not just intellects, emotions, and social. We also have bodies. And our brains work better when our bodies are physically fit. 
The brain doesn't recognize the same sharp division between cognitive and motor function that we impose in our thinking. The same or substantially overlapping brain systems subserve both cognitive and motor function. For example, people think of the cerebellum, have for years thought of the cerebellum as a motor area and prefrontal as a cognitive area. And then when they did neuroimaging, people couldn't believe the results. They kept redoing the studies because we must have done something wrong. Because what you find is that activation of prefrontal and cerebellar is completely correlated. Even if there's no motor function required, a cognitive test that should require prefrontal is requiring the cerebellum just as much. And when one goes down, the other goes down. They're very tightly interrelated. Motor development and cognitive development are also fundamentally intertwined. When cognitive development is perturbed, as in a developmental disorder, motor development is also affected as well. So it's estimated that about half the kids who fit the diagnosis for ADHD or dyslexia or autism would also fit the diagnosis for developmental coordination disorder and reverse. Most of the, half the kids diagnosed with developmental coordination disorder would fit the diagnosis for ADHD, dyslexia, or autism. Though many studies have shown that aerobic exercise improves prefrontal function and executive functions, all but three of those studies have either been with adults or looked at just one single bout of exercise, and those benefits might be very transient. In children, the studies have not found the strong effects of aerobic exercise that they found in adults. Exercise alone appears not to be as effective in improving executive functions as exercise plus character development, like traditional martial arts, or exercise plus mindfulness, like yoga. A lovely study did a random assignment of elementary school children to traditional Taekwondo or standard phys ed. And what they found is the children assigned to Taekwondo showed greater gains than the children in phys ed on all the dimensions of executive function they studied. They were less distractible, they persevered more, they showed better emotion regulation, and this generalized to multiple contexts and was found on multiple measures. Traditional martial arts emphasizes self-control, discipline, and character development. It, uh, it often emphasizes, as in Taekwondo, to not immediately attack. Exercise inhibition, wait for your opponent to be off balance like maybe your opponent attacks first, and take advantage of your opponent being off balance. In a study of adolescent juvenile delinquents, one group was assigned to traditional Taekwondo, and the other group was assigned to modern American martial arts, mm -hmm. which emphasized just the physical component, no element of character development. It emphasized the competitive aspect, and it just emphasized going and attacking, not waiting for opportunity. Those in traditional Taekwondo showed less aggression and anxiety and improved in social ability and self-esteem. Those in modern martial arts showed more juvenile delinquency and aggressiveness and decreased self-esteem and social ability. Whether executive function gains are seen depends in completely on the way an activity is done. Two people can say they're doing the same thing but be doing it very differently and they'll have very different outcomes. Okay, Science Magazine asked me to um, uh, review all the programs and interventions that had been shown empirically to help executive functions in young elementary school age children. And it turns out that a lot of different activities can do that. There are articles showing aerobics, martial arts, yoga, mindfulness, playing a musical instrument, school curricula, lots of different computer training have all been shown to improve children's executive functions. Regardless of the intervention, a, a few principles hold. Executive functions need to be continually challenged to see improvements. And that's consistent with what Erickson has shown when he's looked at expert performance. He says that you need not only to practice, but you need to keep pushing yourself when you practice. If you keep practicing what you can already do, you don't get better. You need to keep pushing the envelope. And the importance of action for learning. The Dalai Lama has said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And that makes perfect sense even to the youngest children. But he also said, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. And the children look at you like, huh? I don't get this. It doesn't make sense. And the only way that it does make sense is to do nice things for other people and see the joy that that gives you when you see the smile on their face, when you see that you made a difference in their lives. 
Ah, back up one. Uh, the rabbi Abraham Heschel said, the act teaches us the meaning of the act. You don't really understand it unless you've done it. And he also was um, talking to probably these very sincere theological students who were terribly worried that when they did good deeds, it made them feel good. Mm -hmm. So were they really being good and doing it for a good motive, or were they doing it to make themselves feel good? And the rabbi said, don't worry. Imagine you're a musician who's only playing in the concert for the money you're going to earn. When you're playing in the concert, if you're thinking about the money you're going to earn, you're not going to do a good job. In the concert, you have to be totally in the moment. So the action he claimed would cleanse the motive. If you put yourself fully in the moment and are fully in what you're doing, doing that will cleanse whatever reasons you had for doing it and educate you. OK, um, we evolved to be able to learn. We evolved to be able to learn to help us act, to help us do what we need to do. If information isn't relevant for action, we don't take it in in the same way. You learn something when you need it for something you want to do, when it's relevant to what you want to do to your life. Um, let me back up for a second. Let me give you an example. Who learns the route better, the driver or the passenger in the car? All of you know, and you know why. The driver learns because he has to use it, and the passenger doesn't learn it so well because he's just passively sitting there. And then for some reason, when we educate students, we have them sit like you guys passively sitting there, and the teacher is up there using the information. So she's learning it really well, <laughs> and we're not so sure about the students. My son gave me the most brilliant lecture on how to program the VCR. It was clear, it was elegant, it was perfect. A week later, when I went to program the VCR, could I do it? Of course not, because the week before, I hadn't listened to it with a mind to, I'm going to do this now. We all know this. We've known it for decades. So why is so much schooling still didactive instruction by the teacher rather than hands-on and active? Ex expeditionary learning, like, uh, like our new uh, directors would say. If you tell a student a concept, that's one thing. But if the student discovers it, that's entirely different. In the end, the students have to own the knowledge. We can help, but it's got to be their work. Um, this is a quote about therapists, but I think it applies equally well to parents and teachers. Work is more, our work is more like that of a midwife. When the baby's born, there's no question to whom it belongs. Lao Tzu says that when the sage is at work, people will say they did it themselves. This is empowerment. The importance of repeated practice. Prefrontal cortex, the area I specialize in, is overrated. Mm -hmm. To learn something new, you need prefrontal. But after it's no longer new, the people who perform best usually use prefrontal least. So this is an old neuroimaging study from the 1990s for a test that requires prefrontal cortex. And some people activate it on both sides. Some people activate it more on one side. Some people more on the other. And two people didn't activate it at all. This is Ruth Brigida and Kathy, oh, Kathy O'Craven my colleagues, collaborators on the study. And because they were familiar with the task, prefrontal activation dropped out. When something is new, those who recruit prefrontal most do best. But when you're really good at it, those who are doing the best recruit prefrontal least. Older brain regions have had far longer to perfect their functioning. They can subserve task performance ever so much more efficiently than can prefrontal. A child may know intellectually at the level of prefrontal that he shouldn't hit another child. But in the heat of the moment, if that hasn't been become automatic, passed off from prefrontal, the child's going to hit another. Even though if you asked him, the child knows perfectly well he shouldn't do that. It's the difference between knowing it at an intellectual level and having it be second nature or automatic. The only way something becomes automatic, becomes passed off from prefrontal, is through action, repeated action. Nothing else will do. And Aristotle knew this back in the fourth century BC. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. We don't act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have these because we've acted rightly. These virtues are formed in a person by doing the actions. We are what we repeatedly do. The way to produce compassionate students is to have them practice compassion. If they act as if they are good, they'll become good. And I think for children, at least, 
The way to get to compassion is through action rather than meditating on compassion. The children haven't had enough experience with compassion and, and how good it makes you feel to be able to just think about it. I think they need to experience it and do it and have it become a part of who they are. And it can be very simple things, um, you know, like just saying thank you or helping somebody carry something. And children also see who we value, who we look up to as role models. And what they see is that students get awards for being the best athlete, for being the best student, but never for being the most caring student, the most selfless student. And they see teachers get evaluated by their academic test scores of the students, not by their humanity or kindness. Um, and I think that we should regularly recognize people for being good human beings, for doing good deeds. The schools could do that. And then the students would see, yes, they care about this too. And we, because we preserve memory through story, you are what you remember, and what you remember are stories. By remembering and retelling tales of your kindness, you create a self that's loving and kind. So I think the students should keep a journal and write down what they've done each day. Not because they're going to get praise for it, but just though they have a record. So they can look back at it and say, gee, you know, I really am a kind of nice guy. I'm not such a bad guy. Um, programs that address the whole child will probably be the most successful at improving any aspect. That's because the different parts of the human being are fundamentally interrelated. Each part probably develops best when no part is neglected. Almost any activity can be the way in, can be the means for disciplining the mind and enhancing resilience. Many activities not yet studied might well improve executive functions. It all depends on the way the activity is done and the amount of time spent doing it, pushing oneself to do better. The most important element is probably that the child really want to do it, so that he'll put in a lot of time at it. It's the discipline and practice that produces the benefits. And if the child loves it, he'll do it. And if he doesn't care about it, it's going to be fighting to try to get him to practice. So you might as well have children do something they can put their heart and soul into. For tens of thousands of years across all cultures, storytelling, dance, art, and play have been part of the human condition. People in all cultures made music, sang, danced, did sports, and played games. There are good reasons why those activities have lasted so long and been found so ubiquitously. They address our physical, cognitive, emotional, and social needs. They challenge our executive functions, make us happy and proud, address our social needs, and help our bodies develop. It could be orchestra, and this is a picture of El Sistema. Uh, Jose Antonio Abreu started El Sistema with the idea that classical music training could rescue poor kids. He envisioned music as a tool for building community. It wasn't that he wanted to create great musicians, it's that he wanted to uplift the kids at risk. Um, dance could do it. And these two are from NDI, the National Dance Institute, which started in New York and is still headquartered here. That was started by Jacques D'Amboise an amazing ballet dancer, amazing, won all kinds of awards. He was a high school dropout, a poor kid from a poor neighborhood headed for trouble. He happened to walk his sister to dance class one day, and the rest is history. So he figured if dance rescued him, maybe it could rescue other at-risk kids. So again, he found that NDI not to produce great dancers, but to help rescue kids. Both programs are, pr are provided free and to all kids. So NDI even includes kids in wheelchairs, El Sistema even includes deaf kids. Because they challenge executive functions directly and because they indirectly support executive functions by increasing joy, providing a sense of belonging and physical exercise, I predict they would help. But there's no data yet on whether they do or not. It could be caring for an animal. There's no data. It could be sports. There's an issue of competition in there that might work against it, but we don't know. There's no data. It could be service activities, activities where the children are working to help their community or people elsewhere. They are acts of caring and generosity. They require executive functions. And each is a member of a group working toward an important shared goal. It could be circus. I have an amazing woman coming to start her PhD with me to look at circus arts. Um, she dropped out of high school when she was 14 to study mime with Marcel Marceau. 
After being a mime for a few years, she discovered circus and went into that. For the last 12 years, she's been teaching circus arts at a Waldorf school. Last year, she went to Harvard to get a master's in education because what she wants to do is get hard data. The people who work in circus will tell you all of these wonderful stories about how it rescues kids' lives, but there's no data. So she wants to do the study that will, that will show it, a rigorous study. Um, in all of these programs, embarrassment is rare. For example, in Tools of the Mind, they provide support, scaffolds. So if you can't do it on your own, you're given help so you can do it. So your experience is always one of succeeding. And as you get better, they gradually remove the supports. In Montessori, often the materials themselves will tell you if you haven't done something quite right. Like you're doing a puzzle and there's one piece left over. It tells you that you know, maybe you need to try again. N nobody ever says this is wrong or, or points out that you made a mistake. And the children are free to progress at their own rate. Contrast that with children feeling pushed or pressured, feeling it would make, be terrible if they made a mistake. If they feel they always have to be the best, they're going to be stressed. And being stressed is detrimental to their doing their best. Many children are so terrified of making a mistake, they're afraid to try anything new. But Einstein pointed out, anybody who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. The only way to be sure you won't make a mistake is to stay with what you already know. Because if you venture out into the unknown, you might be wrong. The only way to completely avoid, that's what I just said. Um, another feature of these programs is the close mentoring relationships. And I think that that's fundamentally important as well. Jerome Frank um, looked at all the different, this is about 60 years ago, wanted to look at all the different methods of psychotherapy to figure out which one is best. So Freudian analysis, behavior modification, all different kinds. And what he found is it didn't matter a twit what kind of psychotherapy the therapist did. What mattered is if he was a caring human being, if there was a, a, a caring connection between the client and the therapist, and the therapist really believed in what he was doing. Um, the British Medical Journal asked what makes a good doctor, and people said the same thing. A good doctor is first and foremost a good human being. And the same thing is true of teachers. Who you are is at least as important as the teaching skills you possess. And um, uh, the flip side of not being judgmental and not embarrassing is to communicate loud and clear the faith and expectation that each child will succeed. Now think about it. Remember when your children or your grandchildren started to walk, their first hesitancy starting to walk. They probably fell down several times, right? Now you didn't say to them, you moron toddler, you get an F in walking today. What you said was it's okay. I know you're going to be able to walk. It's OK. But we don't say that to school children. We don't say, it's OK that you're struggling right now. I know you're going to be able to do this. We communicate, well, maybe you're just a failure here. Goethe said, treat people as if they were what they ought to be, and you help them become what they're capable of being. There's an incredibly powerful um, effect of our expectations for others and the expectations we have for ourselves. So there was a very old study called Pygmalion in the Classroom. It wouldn't pass IRB today. And what they did was they gave IQ tests at the beginning of the school year and then misinformed the teachers about half the, the kids. So half the kids who really had low IQs, they told the teachers they really had high IQs. And half the kids who really scored high, they told the teachers they'd really scored low. Fast forward to the end of the year. The students were perform performing in line with the teacher's expectations. Not in line with their actual test scores, but in line with what the teachers expected of them. And there's lots of evidence that our own expectations for ourselves are critical. There's a whole literature in social psychology called stereotype threat. There are lots of stereotypes in our culture. One of them that is that, in general, men are better at math than women. And sure enough, if you give a standardized math exam, in general, men will do better than women. And that's what they found when they went to a university. They went to another university, exactly the same students, exactly the same kind of students, exactly the same test. They just changed one thing. They said on this, this particular test was designed to be gender neutral. On this particular test, women score as well as men. And what did they find? The women scored as well as the men. But it's the same test. The only difference is the expectations. Uh, so it's incredibly important to help young people believe in themselves and have confidence. Uh, this is a quote. This is my last quote. This is from an El Sistema graduate. 
I see music as a way to rescue children. It's a weapon against poverty. When a child can play an instrument well, it builds his self-worth. He works hard and succeeds. He can then build on that success. He does well in other areas of his life. To me, poverty creates a feeling of powerlessness, but music creates happiness. The children succeed in making beautiful sounds. This represents hope for families and communities. If a child's emotional, social, or physical needs are unmet, those unmet needs will work against the child showing good executive functions and doing well in school. Our brains work better and we have better executive functions when we're not stressed or sad, we're not feeling lonely or isolated, and we're physically fit. What nourishes the human spirit may also be best for executive functions. Perhaps we can learn something from the traditional practices of people across many cultures and thousands of years. The arts, play, and physical activity may be critical for achieving the outcomes we all want for our children. Life and learning can be joyous. Kids can have a great time in school, and they'll do better and perform better on the exams. Even if the goal is only to improve academic achievement, the best way to achieve that is not to focus narrowly on academics alone, but to address children's emotional and social development, as do all the curricula-based programs that improve executive functions, and children's physical development, as do aerobics, martial arts, and yoga. Counterintuitively, the most efficient and effective strategy for advancing academic achievement is not to focus only on academics, but to nurture all aspects of the child. While it may seem logical that if you want to improve academic outcomes, you should concentrate on academic outcomes alone, not everything that seems logical is correct. Thank you very much. <laughs>